Hi everybody, my name is Andrew Valinas. I'm the Executive Director of the Montana Renewable Energy Association. Welcome to beautiful Gold Creek. Uh, we will be talking today about micro hydro systems, one of which is housed right behind us in this little shed. Uh, I want to introduce our guest speaker today, Mr. Rip Hamilton from Solar Plexus. Thanks for joining us, Rip. Thank you. Uh, Rip and I are going to be talking about micro hydro systems, the different components, different considerations, uh, what to think about as far as where the water is coming from, and uh, really everything you need to know about these systems here in Montana. So Rip, why don't we start by uh, you just telling us a little bit about yourself and your, and your work. Yeah, uh, my name is Rip Hamilton with Solar Plexus. We've, uh, we're a renewable energy company, been in business for about 26 years, and st actually started doing micro hydro. So, um, you know, obviously there's not a lot of streams and micro hydro sites in, in Montana. So we branched out, cover about seven states with hydro projects and uh, actually had to go into solar a little bit because there wasn't enough hydro around. So um, hydro is our favorite, but we do a lot of solar too. Great. Uh, well, I'm glad it's your favorite because that's exactly what we're talking about today. Before we dive into the system components, Rip, can you tell us a little bit about maybe some of the initial considerations people should be thinking through uh, before they want to invest in, in a micro hydro system? Yeah, so a lot of clients will call, in the, especially this time of year in the spring when we have high water. Everyone's seeing water running down every drainage there is and they want to jump on and, and put a hydro system in. The, uh, the main consideration is how much water does that drainage flow in the off season. So we usually tell them to take some measurements and come back in you know August, September, October and take some me measurements with the same devices they were using. It, whether it's damming up the stream, putting a small pipe in, using a five gallon bucket and timing it, or if it's at a culvert at a road crossing, you can get a pretty good idea of what the flow is. But the, the flow rates are so variable that it's critical that you get a uh, good measurement during the low flow time of year. That's gonna be the baseline for how much power we can produce. The other critical element is the head. So the vertical distance from where you can take the water out on a, on a piece of property to where you have to return it to the stream. And that elevation is the other important factor. And there's some other critical things, distance the pipeline runs and uh, wire, wire loss from where the turbine is to your point of use, but those are uh, less critical and easier to overcome than the head and flow rates. So the head and the flow rate seems like those are really what you calculate to generate yes. the power and, and a lot of those it sounds like you can do kind of DIY measure at home with the help yep. of maybe your installer. Yeah. Um, what about other considerations like electricity use for the home? Is that something you go over typically with the user? Yeah, we can, so given a, given a resource of water, um, the amount of water and the, and the drop, we can calculate how much power you can produce and more or less tell you what your limitation is on power before you're gonna to have to augment with a generator or with another source, wind or solar. Um, so s establishing that baseline and, and letting the client know that anything above and beyond that is gonna to have to be supplemented. So Rip, one of the considerations obviously for micro hydro is you have to have water on your property um, and water rights are, are an important issue. Can you talk to us a little bit about how some of those considerations? Yeah, so if the water is originating on your property and it's a spring, then the water rights process is relatively easy. Um, meaning meaning about a year process. If you have an irrigation right or an existing water right on the property, you can sometimes get it converted to a hydropower non-consumptive right. That process usually takes a little bit longer. Uh, if you have no water right at all, then uh, you have to make sure that the water basin you're in is um, open to new water right applications. And then you would also want to consider how, where you are in line with other people's water right to make sure that you can ma uh, maintain that flow throughout the year. And where can people go to find out more information about water rights? The DNRC is the best place to check and you can um, find out where your property boundaries are, geocode or whatever, and then contact them to see if the basin's open or not. Great. So micro hydro systems and their design can be really specific to the site that you're on. 
So, Rip, can you tell us a little bit about this site and some of the uh, intricacies of how you designed the system? Yeah, so this site is pretty unique in that it has a nice groundwater spring on site. Uh, we were able to capture the water underground, so there is, uh, we don't have any filtration, we don't have to worry about leaves in the fall or anything like that. Everything's nice and clean year round. Um, and then the water travels 1,400 feet down a pipeline with about 120 vertical feet of drop on it and supplies the turbine behind us here in this powerhouse. Uh, other other sites, we, we've installed catch basins with uh, different types of screen. Some have well slotted well screen, and others have uh, it's called Coanda screen. It's a wedge wire that's fish friendly, um, and, and there are some uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has some rotating screens that they sometimes use. We've used those in Idaho. Um, so there's a variety of options for pulling the water out and still protecting fish if there are fish in the stream. And some of that I imagine will depend on, like we said, this is a uh, ground source system. Um, some of the, the systems are surface water, right? Meaning right. probably what people are more used to thinking about when they think about hydro, which is water flowing down a creek or a stream. Right, so when you, when you are installing a, a system on a stream, the diversion has to be set up so you can let some of the flow go by to satisfy uh, low flow requirements for fish during the winter time, or if there's people with irrigation rights downstream from your, from your head gate. So designing that intake is fairly critical and um, it, can be, it can be a fairly expensive part of the project. So Rip, uh, talking about the size of these micro hydro systems, about, about what size are we looking at with this system and what might somebody, maybe a typical customer need to help produce enough energy to cover their home, home energy loads. Yeah, so this, this system has about 1,400 feet of lineal pipe, 120 feet ahead, and we're running in the neighborhood of 100 gallons a minute. And we're generating about 600 watts continuous. So the average Northwestern Energy home uses about 1,000 continuous, but that's, that includes a lot of heating load. So if you take away hot water heating, uh, your dryer, maybe some range, and you run all that on propane, 600 watts is more than enough to run the house 24-7. So we're supplying a battery bank, and in this case, a, a fairly small battery bank, uh, about 24 volts at 370 amp hours, um, is a tiny bank for the house this size. And it's pretty amazing, and it's simply because those kilowatt hours are replaced every night and, and this, with the systems running 24-7. And you talking about one of the benefits of hydro versus solar, for example, or wind, um, depending on the water source that you have, hydro can run 24 hours a day, right. seven days a week, and the flow might change, obviously, throughout the year. We talked about a high-flow season and a low-flow season, but it's pretty regular power coming through, right? Right, so we're getting 600 watts, and even if, if we've got if we had a really dry year and we had to shut a nozzle off and maybe we were down to 400, um, you wouldn't be able to run this house on a 400 watt solar array simply because you're down to 1.9 hours of full equivalent sun here and averaging about 4.4, whereas the hydro is 24 seven. Great, um, and yeah, one of the very interesting and many benefits of hydro. Yes. Um, obviously it has its other trade-offs for sure, but right. um, that's one of the great things about it. So the water comes in, and we hit this gate valve. That gives us the option to shut the whole pipeline off if we need to do any service work on the turbine. And then we have a second valve for irrigation and firefighting, a third valve to drain the system. If we shut the pipeline off up above, we can drain the whole system out the drain here without running the water through the nozzles. This valve shuts off all the nozzles to the turbine. This is a four nozzle turbine, so we have one, two, three, four, Right now we're ha we have two nozzles on, one and two, three and four are shut off. The water comes in, goes through the, the Pelton wheel, hits the Pelton wheel and spins it, turning the generator, creating the electrons. The water then drops out the bottom into this basin and then follows the drain pipe back to the stream. The electrons would go out to the combiner box where we're monitoring battery voltage and feeding power up to the house. 
and in this particular case everything's 24 volt DC we're watching the battery voltage with these two controllers these are uh, diversion load control so when the battery voltage climbs up to a point where the batteries are going to become damaged due to overcharge these heater loads will kick on and drag the battery voltage back down the unique thing with a hydro system is that it always has to be on it's not like a solar system where you can shut it off so this always has to have a load on it therefore these these heater loads are critical to the operation of the system this particular structure is nice because it just lays over if we have to service it we got plenty of room to work in here and access everything uh, some people will sink these in a concrete vault a little tougher it's a little confined but um, this is a really nice setup the way this is laid out uh, so rip we just looked at the micro hydro system uh, from the outside the one that's hooked up and running this is one of the internal components. Can you tell us a little bit about what this is and how it works? Yeah, so this is, a, this is an actual scaled down version of what we just looked at. This is a, um, the mini, the es &D mini turbine. So in this, in this case, it's a one nozzle turbine. The water would come in and the pressure of the water would hit the Pelton wheel. And when it hits the, comes into contact with the spoons, it rotates it. And that rotation turns the generator, which creates the electricity. Then in, this, in the case of down below, we'd have the discharge below it with a pipe coming out. So this is the, the Pelton wheel or the Turgo wheel part of the turbine, depending on the brand. And like you said, this one is scaled down. This is um, uh, one input, right? Whereas the one that we just looked at had four different inputs for right. the water. This, this turbine would work best with low flow, really high head. So maybe head elevations of uh, maybe 300 feet and a flow rate of probably 10 gallons a minute, 15 gallons a minute. Okay, Rip, so we've walked through the system, we've looked at the different components. Uh, say we're a homeowner and the system is installed and it's producing energy for us. What are some of the next steps that we need to think about? Is there data monitoring? Is there maintenance required? Can you walk us through some of those things? Yeah, so when we install the systems, we typically install a voltage meter, a, an amp meter, so we can monitor what is going on at the turbine itself. And then, obviously, the, the voltage will vary depending on battery use, but it's, it's amps times volts equals watts. So you can multiply the two together quickly, come up with a number, and know whether the turbine's operating properly. Uh, you need to watch and make sure that the screen on the intake is cleared. It, in this case, again, it's unique and, and that everything's underground and super maintenance free and maintenance free is always good. Um, every two or three years, you may have to change bearings depending on how hard the turbine is running. This four nozzle turbine is a little bit overkill on this site and would produce about a thousand watts under ideal conditions. Um, the homeowner doesn't need that much, so they close two of the turbine nozzles and operate more closer to their needs. Still overproducing, but not overproducing so much that the turbine is getting a bunch of unnecessary wear and tear. So turbine bearings, cleaning the screens, and um, just general inspection of everything occasionally is, is all helpful. Great. And then at that point, you're just producing some nice, clean, homegrown energy. Yep. Excellent. 24-7. Well, Rip, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing your expertise. And thank you for tuning into our video. The Montana Renewable Energy Association has lots more information on our website at montanarenewables.org. We hope you will check it out and we hope you'll tune in to another one of our educational videos in the future.